What? Oh. We want this. <clears throat> I want my Bible in front of me. So here's where we're going. We're going Exodus 33 and 34. And I want you to see the title. The title matters. Nuclear Moses, a conduit for Christ. And as we get into it, you might like, what in the world is nuclear Moses? But there's a purpose. There's a reason. And, and I want to hit both chapters because of what it says. So uh, <clears throat> there is no way to kind, of, to, to kind of hit one without the other. They really kind of mirror each other. Let me get there myself. All right. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is after the whole debacle with the making foreign gods, the, the golden calf, at the bottom of the mountain while Moses is getting the directions from God. So he comes down, he grinds it down, the people have to drink it, 3,000 of them die because they have to turn against their own brothers because people are still having a big party and they're not paying attention. And then Moses goes back up to God. He's going to spend another 40 days in his presence without eating, without drinking, just spending time in God's presence, God speaking to him and sustaining him. Because again, he's Jehovah Jireh, <clears throat> providing everything Moses needs and way more. He says, I got, I got to find out what God wants to do with you people. So he goes back up to God on the mountain. And then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. And go to the land that I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I'll give it to your descendants. <clears throat> I'll send an angel before you, and I'll drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I'm not going to go with you because you're a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, <coughs> and no one put on any ornaments, any jewelry. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Take off your ornaments, and I'll decide what to do with you. <coughs> so the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Again... Just a note, if you have children, if, if you're a father, you've had moments where you would say, hey man, not again, chill, that's, that's not okay. Well, that thing you just said was rude or I need you to go apologize. And then there's things that went way past the line and you're like, I, I, can't, even, I can't even right now, but understand that I'm furious. So... What I'm telling you is, no messing around, do exactly what I say, do it right now, move, and they do it. Because they realize, oh, whoops, I went way past where I should have gone. This was bad news. Dad's tone, his voice, the two veins I don't normally see that are sticking off his forehead, uh, pulsing, that's unusual. This is probably a different situation than probably shouldn't do that for the fourth time. This is different. <coughs> probably shouldn't make a golden calf right now. Uh, that was a big old no-no. He's ticked. Uh, let's listen. God knows how to send a message. I will never forget. Becky and I were very young in our faith, not even married yet. We were doing something we weren't supposed to do. Wouldn't be appropriate to tell you what that was, but what I will say is we ask God, if this really is that wrong, brand new believers, could you just send us a message? <laughs> Lightning outside our window that rattled the windows. And it was a kind of lightning, Florida lightning, where we were, where you hear the lightning. People are like, oh, what do you mean the thunder? No, I mean the lightning. You literally, you know. Okay, Florida people, you hear the S. There is this static and, and then all of the, of the air seems to go out of the air. It's just silent. Boom, and then that. It's too close. It's, it, you know that it probably just blew out someone close by. And it was the middle of the night, and so this light flashes, the boom. That stopped our activity instantly. 
we knew it was not of God. And, and it, he had just answered so fast. It, it was the pulse. It was like, we've been here before. I've already spoken. Don't. We got the message. <clears throat> this is one of those. Take off your ornaments. I am going to decide what to do with you. <laughs> taking it off. <laughs> you know, I didn't forget anything, did I? Now Moses used to take a tent <clears throat> and he'd pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting, meeting with God. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent <clears throat> of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while he, the Lord, spoke with Moses. And whenever people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their own tent. That's pretty powerful. I mean, just imagine. Oh, Moses, he's going to the tent. He's going to the tent of meeting. And everybody, they whisper, whisper, whisper. Two million people all coming out to the tents, coming out of the tents. Everybody's watching. says they all come out. And they watch. And then you see it. Like, it's guaranteed. Here comes, here comes the pillar. Like, out of the sky. Another thing in Florida, we're playing basketball. Nobody wants to leave. Lightning blast, lightning blast, lightning blast. And we're like, we really should go. But there's no rain yet, so we keep playing. <laughs> and then this funnel comes down out of the clouds. Like a giant toilet paper roll. Just, and then went back up. Now let's keep playing. We, we did keep playing. Until another one landed. And then everybody ran for their lives. I was about 20 feet from that tornado. It was called a... Uh, land spout. It's just beneath an F1. So watching all the grass go flat, like someone pressed an invisible CD on it and was moving it quickly to the basketball court where we were, and watching grown men scream like little children, and, and me doing the same thing, running much slower than all these young pups that could run faster than me. And we just grabbed fences, trees, anything, hoping for the best while that thing came. Hit the water, sucked up water like a giant straw, so much power. You couldn't hear. You're screaming. You can't hear each other. That's powerful to see up close. It's frightening and powerful to see up close. To know it's coming, like Moses goes and he gets to the, to the tent and they know here it comes. I'm sure it wasn't just this super quiet little elevator. I'm sure it was a God makes an entrance and they can see it and they start worshiping because that's their God. That's the one that freed them. That's the one that got them out of Egypt. That's the one that split the Red Sea. That's the one that they stupidly traded in for a trinket of gold. And they're like, we're so sorry. That's the real God. And then whenever Moses went out to the tent, the people rose. They stood at the entrance to the tent. They watched Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went in the tent, the pillar of the cloud comes down, stays at the entrance <clears throat> while the Lord spoke with Moses. And all the people are worshiping at their own tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And then Moses would <clears throat> return to the camp. But his young aide, Joshua, Son of Nun did not leave the tent. Joshua was going to be the next leader. He's in the tent too. And he stays there because God's still speaking to him. Moses said to the Lord <clears throat> in one of these conversations, you've been telling me, lead these people. But you haven't let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, hey, I know you by name and you found favor with me. If, <clears throat> if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember, this nation is your people. I, lo I, love, I love the recorded prayers in the Word of God. 
because they're just so raw and honest. They're just honest, you know. It's, it's not these holy sections of sentences that don't make much sense to us because it feels like someone's an actor in a play. Like they're real. Why is he saying, remember, they're your people? Because he just told them, if I go two steps with you, I'm going to kill you all. To, I'm trying to figure out what to do with you. Remember, they're your people. <laughs> Before you just squash them. Before some plague comes in and wipes everybody out. Remember, they're your people. You promised them something. You said you're pleased with me. Don't kill my whole family. The Lord replied. And God's, re God's response my presence will go with you, and I'll give you rest. This is that moment after the moment with your kid. You know? Dad, you still real mad? <laughs> it looks like your face is normal again. No, man, it's okay. Look, I love you. I love you. For the love of God, the thing that you were just doing is like way out of the range of what I thought you would do. Why? We got to talk about that. Now I can talk. <clears throat> he says to Moses, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us up from here. It sounds a little obnoxious. But it isn't. It's beautiful. Saying, if you won't go, I don't want to go. If you're not in it, I don't want it in me. If you're not leading me in that direction, I don't want to go there. So if your presence isn't there, I shouldn't be there. That's an amazing stance. It's a beautiful stance. I know it pleased the Father's heart. You just said you might not go another step with us, but you're telling me to take them. So does that mean, what does that mean? I'm, I don't even want to go, God, if you're not going. That's how we got to approach this walk. If you're not going there, God, then I'm not going there. If you are going there, then I don't want to be left here. Early on, a day I couldn't say a lot, my daughter was cerebral palsy. And you might be thinking, well, I don't, does she say a lot now? Because she'll be quiet in a crowd. Oh, she's a little chatterbox when she's not, you know, here. If she's at home, she, she, she thinks she rules that house, actually. And uh, I wasn't moving fast enough. I was studying the Word the other day. She was like, get me up. I said, honey, I'm, just, I'm still doing something. She goes, get off your phone. <laughs> she yells out from the other room. And I was like, <laughs> you know, like it's in my hand. <laughs> But like, well, it's kind of the phone. I'm reading the word. Wait, why am I explaining myself to you? I said, wait, I will be in in a minute. I want to get up. And she's just having this conversation with me. <clears throat> People don't know she does. Uh, and she's funny. But this um, time would come when I'd be wanting to go do some simple little task like go to the Walmart, pick something up, or whatever, especially, especially when she was little. And, and I, she's a daddy's girl, so if I was leaving the house, she was leaving the house. If I was home, she was elated, and I wouldn't, could not go anywhere now unless she was also going. Yeah. And, and we would try to, and, and I didn't know, because she wasn't saying as much then, that she knew everything that was happening, so we would like talk above her like she didn't get it. And, oh yeah, I'm going to go to the store. Ah! Now she's freaking out. Because she thinks I'm doing that quietly because I'm trying, which is true, to sneak out the door. She just hit that doorknob. What? If I was going, she was going. So then it's the wheelchair ramp, wheelchair, get her strapped up, make sure she's changed, get all the stuff together. 
back then we didn't have the wheelchair ramp actually let me be more accurate as to why i didn't like doing this all the time back then i had to disassemble the wheelchair and put it in the back of the minivan and and then reassemble it to get her into her seat and out of her seat everywhere we went so like on a rainy day that was horrible and i love my wheelchair van i'm so thankful for my wheelchair van it's much faster and different but if i was starting to go somewhere what? And we couldn't whisper around her. We couldn't say it in some kind of pig Latin. She always knew. She saw me walking for the door. She's going. That is how Moses is with God. I don't care what you have to assemble. I don't care that I'm, I can't move like you can move. I don't care that you have to drag me along with two heel prints in the sand. Take me. <laughs> Wherever you're going, take me. Well, I'm going to probably... Ah! You know, Moses is like, I'm going too. How will anyone know? Verse 16, how will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? <clears throat> and God could be like, well, I did 10 plagues in Egypt to blow the most powerful nation off the face of the earth to get you out of there and you know, split a sea open. That doesn't happen too often. I walk around as a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud, day or night, take your pick. You know, it would be all kinds of answers he could answer. <clears throat> that distinguishes you. But he knows what Moses is saying. If he's not with him, none of that stuff happens. They didn't manufacture any of this freedom. It was all given to them. And if God's not giving it, they don't have it. If God's not protecting them, they're not protected. He knows this. They all know it. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. This whole, this whole transaction, all I can think of is Jesus. When he says to the disciples, you haven't asked for anything in my name yet. The time is coming now where you're going to start asking for everything in my name because I'm Lord. When you ask for things in my name, I will do it. If you ask for things in my name and two of you agree, I will do it. And, there, and people get that so twisted. They just think they can just ask for just anything as long as they just add the name of Jesus to their prayer. But this is what he's saying. When you understand that I'm Lord, and if I'm not in it, you shouldn't be in it, and if I'm in it, you should be in it, ask away. If it's in my will, if it's in my plan, if it's in my way, you will get that prayer answered, and we'll go together. And the more that you spend time with me, the more the Scripture says you become like me. God's saying, the more you behold me, the more you become like me. Then your prayers start... All that time with him isn't so you can just spill out all the stuff that you want God to do. It's all this time where you're talking to him, praying with him, worshiping him, anything, just near him, right here, to, corporately together. Preparing your heart to want what he wants. So your prayer actually reflects the Spirit of God. The more you spend time with him, the more you're in his presence, the more you start to reflect his character. You can't even help it. Ephesians tells us that anything, anything that a light shines on becomes itself a light. And we start to reflect who he is. And then you can pray in his name because you're actually praying in the character and the quality of his name, of, who, of his character, who he is. How he speaks. Because he does. Yeah. Amen. He knows, his, he knows how many hairs are on his head. Absolutely. But he knows him by name, meaning he knows his character. He knows everything that's in him. He knows everything that makes him what he is. He knit him together in his mother's womb. That's a great point. He says, you pray in my name, in my character. I know your name. I know what you're all about. He knows everything, which is wild. Scripture says that, even, that the word even exposes our hearts. It, 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 it divides everything, soul, spirit, bone, marrow, and, and, and it 
exposes our hearts. He, he knows our name. Then Moses said, and I love this. <clears throat> They're having this conversation. You got to go. I'll go. Mm. You said you might destroy us all. You really got to go. These are your people. I am pleased with you. I'm going to go. He gives him the second affirmation. He goes, okay, then. <clears throat> Moses said, now show me your glory. It sounds like kind of a ridiculous command. Like he could be offended. You have not seen all the cool stuff I've done? You didn't sit for 40 days when I sustained you and you didn't eat any food or drink any water? I'm doing it again right now? That's not cool to you? Like, like I, I grew up to attend a meeting and I come down as a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud. That isn't showing you my glory. And he knows that Moses knows that's not. He wants to see God's character, the true, real God. Not just things that he does, not just works of God, not just miracles. He wants to know God. He wants to see him and understand everything he's about. Not just everything he can do for him. Who are you? Who are you? I, we, I, I get it that we've only barely scratched the surface of who you are and what you're doing in us. Like we, 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 we have so little understanding of who he really is. We see things in the word. <clears throat> And it's so often that we're so freaked out by regular life that we don't even trust him to take care of us. And, and, and we're looking for what can you do, God? What can you do? When you really, we just need to be looking for who are you, God? Who are you? That's the big difference because he's already going to take care of the problems. He's already there for that. He's already Jehovah Jireh, the provider. He's already all the strength and power and provision that we need. We just got to draw close to him to figure out who he is. Because the more we do, we start to figure out who we are and who we were created to be. <clears throat> so Moses' command, more than a request, now show me your glory. There's this weird scripture, and I think it's Matthew 12, 11. It says in the King James that the kingdom of heaven, uh, I'm not saying this exactly correctly, but the word it used was violently, is, was, is moving violently forward, and men of violence take hold of it. It was such a weird scripture. I read that and I thought, there's nothing in that that seems to reflect your character, God. Men of violence. Because you think of that, you think people that would do stuff to other people for no good reason. They're just violent men. But it's not what it's saying at all. And you read it in a bunch of translations and what it's saying is aggression. Not, a, not mean aggression. Aggressive. That's what I'm trying to say. Aggressive aggressively going after God. Not passively. Not, well, God, if you show up, awesome. If you don't, you don't. A little flippant prayer before we eat. Uh, I'm just kind of going to go to church and then do whatever I do in the week and go to church again. That makes me feel a little bit better spiritually. It is like a pursuit. It's a pursuit of all that he is. It's a pursuit of his character. It's so different. Men of violence. Men who will aggressively attack this pursuit of the kingdom. They're going to go after it with both hands. It means something to them. It has high value and they're willing to fight for that. And that's where Moses is. He, he aggressively says, he doesn't say, could you please show me your glory? You going to stay with us? Yes, I'll stay with you. I know you by name. They're your people. You going to stay with us? I'm going to stay with you. I promise. Well, show me your glory. <laughs> like, like, prove it. <laughs> prove it. And the Lord said, all right, I'll cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I'll even proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And if you've been listening, 
it says that he goes to the tent of meeting and the cloud comes down and God speaks to him as a friend face to face. How is that happening? He says, you can't see my face. But he speaks to him face to face. Pretty wild. Just read a little bit more. Just you know, let that bug you for a second. Yeah. Then the Lord said, <clears throat> there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. <laughs> Which just, I don't know, maybe... This is awesome to me in so many levels, but one of them is he stood there waiting for God. God picks him up. He said, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. So God picks him up. It'd be like me picking up Adea and putting her in that car seat to go on a ride with me. He, he, he can't put himself where he needs to be to see God this way. So God, like he just waits with his arms up. Okay, Dad, time to go. Dad picks him up, puts him in this cleft of a rock. It's the only place that he can safely be to be this much in God's presence while his glory, he's not coming a pillar or a cloud, it's going to be God. No, no, no representation of him, it's him. And he puts him in this cleft of a rock and, then go, and puts a hand over him. Okay, he can't see me yet, you know. <laughs> like kids do. And, and then until I pass by, because if you see my face, it was still going to kill you. And goes by declaring his name. And I love what he says. There's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And my glory will pass by. Obviously, this is Jesus Christ. Obviously, he's putting him He's wrapping Jesus around him because that is the only filter by which you can be in God's presence. God himself, the Son, God the Father. The Son wraps around him and allows him to be in that presence just like Jesus does for us to allow us to be in God's presence wherever we are, whenever we want. We've got the cleft of the rock whenever we need it. God, Jesus himself said, build everything on the rock. Don't build on the sand. Build on the rock, and the rock is my word. Build it on that. Stay in that cleft, and you'll see God's presence. And I'll pass by. And then I'll remove my hand, and you'll see my back, but your, my face must not be seen. I just remember, my face must not be seen. So now, 34. Stay with me, because this is... It's not like wicked long, but like 30 verses or so. And um, a lot of it is exactly what he has already spoken. Because remember, Moses threw those and broke those <laughs> tablets that had all that writing on it because he was mad. So he's, got, he's hearing it again. And we already heard it because God spoke a lot of this in earlier chapters. So you're going to hear the verbiage and it's going to sound the same. Since I've already done a lot of teaching on that, I don't want to stay on that so much. I want to read through it. But there's something at the end that's highly valuable. And I, that's where I want to land tonight. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two tone tablets, stone <laughs> tablets, like the first ones. Ooh, I try that again. Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. <clears throat> and I'll write on them. The words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one's to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. <clears throat> Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones, and he went up on Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. <laughs> Brian and I were talking about this in my office today. How many times did he not want to get up early? How many times did he not want to carry stone tablets up a mountain? 
they got a new TV show, a reality show called The Summit. Just came out. And, you know, you, you got to go up this mountain that's thousands of feet high in New Zealand with this group of people. And they've purposely picked people that are just in crazy good shape and people that are just barely getting to Planet Fitness once a year. And they're all thrown together, and they all have an equal amount of money. And every time one of them doesn't make it, they lose that amount of money off, <laughs> off of the total sum. So they've got to help each other up the mountain. But then there's tricks where you can steal someone's money. And so they try to get each other's money. Clever show, fun. But they come across the most horrific obstacles. High heights. You know, just, I've been on Mount Katahdin, and I saw the knife's edge, and no thank you. That'll never happen for me. It'll never happen unless someone brings me out there on a stretcher. I can't move. I get close to it, and it, it just drops thousands of feet on both sides. And you, there's this piece about as wide as this, um, you know, staircase. And I'm like, no, no. Wind's blowing. I can't do it. It's, I freeze. It's, I, heights and me are not friends, and that's too dangerous. <clears throat> and they're just walking on ropes from over caverns and things to get to the other side. And they got things if they fall, but I don't want to dangle that far either. <laughs> I don't want any of it. I would be done. Take my money. Moses has no safety rope. He's carrying these tablets. He's getting up early in the morning, and everybody else is eating manna every day, and he doesn't eat. He fasts for 40 days. This is not easy, what he's doing. Understand that. It's not like, okay, you want to see my presence? Climb the mountain, put every, tell everybody to set up all the parameters. They can't come near it. Here's the stone tablets. Well, actually, no, you broke those. Chisel some new ones out. Once you've chiseled them out, carry them up the mountain. I need both hands to climb this mountain. Yeah, well, you'll figure it out. When you, it was, that's why I'm starting you early. Get started early. You're going to need the extra time because these things are heavy. They're rock. And so he's, he's got two stone tablets up. A, that's not easy. There's a lot of times things that we want to do to get close to God aren't easy. Getting up early before the day starts so that you get some time with him isn't easy. It takes some discipline. But man, is there a reward to that. Blowing some time out of your schedule where it's just you and God in the middle of your day when you normally would do something else. It's not easy. But the moment that you connect with him is worth everything you did to get to that. The moment that all that fight suddenly opens up with him saying one word to you, everything changes. Life changes. It's all worth it. Moses chiseled out two stone tablets. He doesn't whine. Why do I got to do that? How come it's got to be early? How come I got to get all the way to the top? Can't you build an escalator? We do this all the time. It'd be nice to have like a path, maybe some steps. <clears throat> Even when he dies, God says, climb the mountain. <laughs> He's 120. <laughs> climb up the mountain. I'll talk to you, I'll talk to you at the top. Uh, you can't go into the promised land. You struck the rock twice earlier when I told you not to. He's got to climb a mountain just to get to his grave. Like he's always working. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. Moses chiseled out the two stone tablets like the first ones and went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. <clears throat> and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and he stood there with him. Oh, I love that. Then the Lord came down and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. Now he's got him in the rock now. And he passed in front of Moses with his hand in front of Moses. He passes in front and he proclaims his name. Listen to God's name. Now we know he's got all these names. Jehovah Jireh was one I've mentioned a lot tonight because it just felt like that was very appropriate. Uh, I feel like the Lord was saying that. <clears throat> so we know El Shaddai, we know Jehovah Nisi, we, we hear these names of God. And they're all through the word. But when he says to God, what's your name? And he says, I'm going to proclaim my name. What's your character? I'm going to proclaim it right in front of you. Here's what God says is his name. The Lord, the Lord, twice. 
He has to be Lord of your life. He can't be co-pilot. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. <clears throat> we have a hard time maintaining love to one person. We have a lot of difficulty maintaining love. Maintenance to a relationship is really difficult. Maintenance to thousands, millions, all time, over all time, forever. He can maintain it. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't get tired of you. He doesn't kick you out of heaven once you've made it. You know what? You've been here like 10,000 years. Your attitude's really getting on me. It's not that way. He can maintain it. To maintain love, you've got to challenge someone. To maintain love, you've got to support someone. To maintain love, you've got to die to yourself. He's done all of it. He does all of it. He created sleep so we could rest. When does he sleep? He made an earth that rotates so that the sun's only on certain parts of it, so we're always up whining. He's got to listen all the time. Day, 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 day. There's no night for him because he lives in light. And he, and, and, and he loves it. The interaction matters to him. You can't be passive in a relationship. You want to maintain love? You can't be passive. You can't just do what you want to do. You've got responsibilities to that relationship. How could this God have responsibilities to 2.5 million people? How about 9.7 on the planet? Billion. How about everyone that's lived and died since he created it? Maintaining love. People that won't accept Christ and they die shaking a fist at him and the only entrance was the, the, the narrow gate. He's the gate. He said, I'm the gate. Invite me in, make me Lord of your life and you'll live forever with me. It's that easy. I'll wipe your sin away. I did it at the cross. The work's already finished. And, and it's that simple. And people will still, oh, God's so mean and angry, he sends people to hell. No, he gave you every ticket out of it. One ticket, actually, out of it. And just said, you can have one, you can have one, you can have one, you can have one. And people just shaking a fist at him. Yeah. Till they're dead. Do you think he stops loving them? He can't. Because he is love. And he will maintain love even though they did not. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The name of God. So if we pray in the name of Jesus, who is God, we need to pray in this. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger. Abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, forgiving people that ticked you off, forgiving ones who really hurt you. We're called to it. It's actually a requirement of the kingdom. Rebellion, sin, all forgiven. Betrayal. Yet... He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Some of you are like, oh, see, angry God. Well, how would you like to sit in a courtroom? And people did really horrible things to people. He says, yep, go free. Yep, go free. For nothing. Someone's got to be on the bench. Someone's got to de deliver the punishment. 
not a real fun position to be in, actually, to be the one that decides. A lot of pressure to that. And God says, I'm not just going to let sin go unpunished, but I will die for it. I'm not going to let my people stay prisoners. But there will be punishment for sin. Now we know that. Go sin. See what happens. <laughs> there's, there's a punishment. There's a punishment in this life that goes with sin. You can, I do prison ministry. I love prison ministry. But there are guys in there who did things that, that they will be in there for life. It's the penalty that went with the sin, and yet they're going to go to heaven forever. They're free. But sin has a punishment to it, and God says, I will punish for sin. Moses, i got to keep rolling. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. He heard that, and he's down. I mean, when you stand in the presence of a living God, and you're aware of his presence, no one's bored in that moment when you're aware of it. People that are not aware of it and just, oh, God, that they can do that until they find them out themselves. But if God's in the room and he's present, it's electric. It's not boring. And so you've got, you've got Moses hears the name of God, sees the character of God, watches God pass by, and just falls to his face, bowed to the ground at once. I like the at once, and worshiped. Lord, he said, if I found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like Peter, James, and John at the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and Jesus is just Jesus, and then all of a sudden, Jesus glows. He's lit up like a light bulb. His clothes look like lightning. He looks like lightning. And a cloud, the Shekinah glory, comes through the top of the mountain. And you hear a voice in it. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And Peter is like, let's build shelters and live right here. Let's live here forever. I never want to leave this place where you are that close. I don't want to leave. They're on top of the mountain. They're with God. God speaks in the cloud. They see the body of God, and they see the character of him, and they don't want to leave. And said so they're petrified. And here you see Moses the same way, bows to the ground, worships at once. If I found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. I always want to be where you are, please. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive. I love this. You will find this in the greatest men in the Word of God. You will always find this in the greatest men of the Word of God and women. I don't mean to just delineate. In the greatest people of God, you will find this. You ready? If I found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness in our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Moses didn't blow it. He was on the mountain communing with God. Everyone at the bottom blew it. He goes to the bottom, fixes it, goes back up and says, forgive our sin, and owns it like it was his. You'll find this in the greatest people that you will find in the Word. Because they recognize that they are sinners saved by grace alone. So he, he's like, he doesn't go to the past 40 days where he's done only everything right. Climb the mountain, down the mountain, up the mountain, doing everything God told him. Tell the people, do this. I'm the voice of God to the people. Exodus 3 says, I'm going to make you like God and Aaron your priest. And then he says it again in Exodus 7, verse 1. I'm going to make you God to Pharaoh, and Aaron will be your high priest. He will see it that way. So he keeps saying to everybody, I'm going to make you like God. And he goes, I'm just a worthless human being that's a sinner. I'm broken. 
I'm falling on my face before you. I'm sorry for our sin. And doesn't say, what would you include me in this for? Those are the losers that made the calf. I went down there and fixed that mess. After spending time with you, God, I'm one of the good ones. It's not what he does. It's not what Daniel does. Daniel does everything right. And then you find him praying. I think it's chapter 9, 10, 9, I think. He starts praying and begging God to forgive him and his people for forsaking their God. What? He's the only guy you can find in the world. There's just nothing wrong with him other than Jesus. You'll keep finding it. All through the word, the, these most important people will say, God, forgive us. They recognize The only one that couldn't say it, who was so, so great, still human but fully God, was Jesus. He said, forgive them. Because he'd never sinned. There's no deceit in his mouth. He'd never sinned. But still was willing to die for the others. Then the Lord said, I'm making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you here today. I'll drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which all through the word is seven nations larger than them. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land. Where you are going? There'll be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles. Don't worship any other god for the Lord whose name is Jealous. Ooh, we just got another part of his name. Whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. <clears throat> Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land. When they prostitute themselves to their gods and they sacrifice to them, they'll invite you and you'll eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons and those daughters prostitute themselves to their foreign gods, they'll lead your sons to do the same thing. Don't make idols. Any idols. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days, eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb. But if you don't redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. Listen to that. Redeem the firstborn with a lamb, the lamb of God. But if you don't redeem it, break its neck. If they're not redeemed, it's just, it's heaven or hell. Redeem all your firstborn sons. No one is, appear, no one is to appear before me empty-handed. Six days you'll labor. On the seventh day you'll rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest, even when it's hot, rest. Find time to spend with God even when the schedule is hot is what he's saying. Celebrate the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest, the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. Listen, I'll drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will covet your land when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. They did this over and over and over, and they were not attacked when they would do this. When they all went together, following God's directions, he would put up walls that foreigners... Uh, enemies couldn't attack. They wouldn't even want to at those times. Don't offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. And don't let any of the sacrifice from the Passover remain until morning. He's said all these things before, but it's a repeat. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Don't cook a young goat in its mother's milk. This super weird thing. We talked about this before. Don't kill a child in the very thing that was from the mother that was meant to support it. Don't ever kill a child in the very fluid that the mom has that was meant to protect the child. Don't do that. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words. For in accordance with these words, I've made a covenant with you in Israel. We, we've, had, we've, had a, we've had a division in our nation and people aren't paying attention to the stance Abortion kills children. There's no way around it. Please don't misunderstand that. It kills them. You're taking a living child and killing that child that God knit together in the womb. God can forgive that sin. God saves people after that sin. But it's a sin. And it's a someone's life. My body, my rights. Well, there's two bodies. That one's got no rights. It's not fair. And to, just, and to just flippantly be talking about it like it's a subject to discuss. God says, this, this is abhorrent to me. Don't, because it's such a weird, don't cook a young goat, it's mother's milk. Don't kill the child with the mother's own fluid where it's supposed to support its life. Right. Just to be clear. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words I've made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days, 40 nights, and I'm almost finished, so stay with me because this ending is crazy. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant. Nuclear Moses. He's glowing. His face is lit up. His face is lit up like Jesus would be lit up. He's, he's lit up. He doesn't know it. He's completely unaware of it. He's just walking down the mountain like, wow, I've just been spending time with God. It's been so amazing. This is, or, wow, I've just been spending time with God carrying these heavy stones down the mountain. He doesn't even know. He's probably straining to get down the mountain. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, glowing, and they were afraid to come near him. They literally went away from him. They ran away. That's what most people do when you see a glowing guy walking towards you. You don't go to him. Whether it's plutonium or it's like, Halloween, that's a scary thing to see. <laughs> a glowing person walking towards you is frightening. When Aaron and all the Israelites see him, they run away. They won't come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and spoke. He spoke to them, face glowing and all. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai with a glowing face. When Moses finished speaking to them, <coughs> he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed that veil until he came out. And when he came out, and he told the Israelites what he had been commanded. They saw that his face was radiant again. And then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord again. So he tells them everything with his face all aglow. Then he puts it on until he speaks to God again. Paul tells us in the New Testament why he was doing that. It's because the glory was fading. He would put the veil on, not because they were scared of him, and he was trying to make them more comfortable to listen to the instructions so they can actually pay attention. He would tell them with his face all uncovered. Then, after telling them, he would put the veil on. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us he would do that because the glory was vanishing. It was fading. And they would see it fading away. Then he'd go talk to God, and it was there again. He was unaware of it the first time, but when he became aware of it, that he was wearing God's face, 
and that it was hard for people to look at it. Because God said, you can't see my face. And when they would see him like this, it'd petrify them because God said, I'm going to make you like that. Let me give you the, I'll give you the scripture reference. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Yeah, Let, I'll, I'll read it. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, this ministry through Christ, we don't lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor do we distort the, tr- the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, some people can't see it, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed, perplexed, but not despair, uh, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Oh, I went too far. I've, I've gone too far. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 18. I went too far. I apologize. That veil reference is the second part of this. this so if you're taking a note, you ask where was it? 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 18. This is why. Sorry about that. That other, that other scripture is beautiful, so I don't apologize for that. But it's, I should have read this one. I should have read this one first. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved letters on stone, came with glory... So Israelites couldn't look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory. Transitory, though it was, it was fading. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory in comparison with the surpassing glory, the surpassing glory of God. And if it was transitory... If what was transitory came with glory, like it goes away, but it's glorious when it's there, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts, which remains? Therefore, since we've got such a hope, we're very bold. We're not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For that day, the veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is the veil taken away. That's why God tore it in half. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. It's not transitory. Now it lasts forever. Glow face. Now you've got it. Now you're nuclear. It doesn't go away. There is something that people notice in the presence of a Christian that's just there. They can't put a finger on it. They don't even understand it. But it's there. And another believer recognizes the glow. And it lasts. We had this last point, 729. We had this thing out back in Florida, again, of three tilted water pots, and, and water would come down over it. So it made like this constant waterfall. And it was, it was real pretty, and it was beautiful, and you love to hear it. Like you go back, and very, very, you know, a nice aesthetic on the backyard. And you'd fill the thing with water, and you had a little pump in it, and the pump kept it going. So the water would come up from inside of it and then go all over the face of it, and you'd see it, and this, you'd just have this constant living water, you know? But it was frustrating because the sun down there, like you'd have a, a thunder shower at 3 a.m. That water was so full on the sides of the road, you could take a canoe down both sides of the road because they were all crowned because there was so much water and it would just sit on top of the sand. 
But then the sun would bake it, and like an hour later, it would all be gone, and you're just walking on dry ground. It would just, it would just like evaporate that fast. And so you'd fill this thing with water, but just in the little bit of time that was trickling down the face of the three water barrels, it would evaporate. So you'd have to fill the thing like every three days, or it'd just be a pump pumping nothing, and it would burn out your pump, and it would blow it, and then you'd have to go get another pump. The reason that thing, the Lord brought that to my mind this morning, because I hadn't thought about it forever. It, we, I hadn't thought about it since about the fifth pump we blew. I just took it, and I threw it in the bushes. Out back where well, you couldn't see it anymore. Not a cool aesthetic anymore. It looked like a forgotten paradise. Because I was tired of filling the dumb thing with water, and I was tired of the pumps that I had to keep replacing that it would destroy because there was no water in it. Because the water was transitory. It would only last for a little while before it either evaporated or the pump died. But Christ said to the woman at the well, I'm going to put my spirit in you. And that water's going to bubble up inside you. You won't have to come here to find it and then have to come back and come back and come back. and go. It's always there. It'll bubble up inside you. It'll well up. I'm putting the Holy Spirit pump inside you and it won't burn out. And I'm the one <coughs> that's going to fill it with water in the first place. <coughs> not water that's going to evaporate. Not, not a pump that burns out. I'm going to put my spirit in you and my spirit will remain. You'll be nuclear. And the living water will keep coming up from within inside. <coughs> it doesn't mean you live however you want to live. And that water just keeps coming up. Because <coughs> the reality is we're meant to be a conduit. Jars of clay, literally like the word just said, we're jars of clay. But the water comes from God. All the life comes from him. All the glow comes from him. All the effectiveness in ministry comes from him. We can't look at the rest and go, well, I'm not like them. I'm the one that's really working at this. Can you fix these weak Christians? There's Christians and then there's Christians. You hear that stupid stuff? The way that God sees it is there's none righteous, not even one. You would have all gone to hell if I didn't die on the cross. So we don't get to say, we just get to say, God, thank you for forgiving us and please be with my family. I'm called to that. And then a glow. And when you can't get there, trust in the God of all creation to prime the pump. And you want to prime the pump? Spend time with him. Abide in Christ and spend time with him. Get up early, pick up your stones, and ask him to write something on your tablet. You, you, how do I hear from you? How do I hear from you, God? I never hear from God. Well, go somewhere quiet where you can. Go somewhere quiet where you will. Read the word, pray, be hungry enough and aggressive enough to take the kingdom by storm. Demand that you hear from him. He loves that. The pump's on the inside now. To the believer, unveiled face. You know, the scripture said there was nothing in Jesus that was comely, nothing to make you say, oh, what an attractive guy. I'm interested in what he has to say. There's nothing in him that attracted you to him except an unveiled face. Nothing hidden, no deceit, power of God. I've said this before, you cannot take the 4,000-mile Nile and squeeze it into a straw and expect no one to notice. Like God was pouring out of him every kind of way. You can't take the God of the universe, squeeze it into a human being, and be like, no one's going to pay attention. Well, that's what he did with us. The God of the universe squeezed the Holy Spirit of God into us. And you're wearing it. Know that. and Know that he loves to speak to his children. We can aggressively pursue the relationship.
7.35. I went over. Sorry. I'm going to pray. Pray us out. Lord Jesus, you clearly said that the water, the living water of your Holy Spirit would bubble up inside of us who believe in your name. <coughs> Give us strength when we don't have it. Speak through us when we have nothing to say. Forgive from our heart when we hate someone. Overcome fear when there's no courage, not even a drop left in us. You have done things in my life and through my life that I could never, ever even come close to attempting had it not been you in this jar of clay but you put a nuclear reaction inside of us. <coughs> and we're jars of clay, but we're conduits of Christ. Help us, my living God, to look like that proverb that says, a lizard can be grasped in the hand, but it lives in king's palaces. Help us not to forget we live in the king's palace. And help us not to forget that we're a palace that the king lives in. We love you, Jesus, and thank you for all you do. Shine through us. Amen.